Welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate, a show dedicated to providing up-to-date information news to Hawaii home buyers, sellers, and investors. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner, and wife, Leonie Lam, a realtor with over 20 years experience in various leadership roles in the Hawaii real estate industry. Thanks, Will. Will is a lawyer with a background as the former head of a Hawaii title and escrow company. And now that we're full-time in real estate, we work together as a team to bring you the latest in Hawaii real estate. And we're really excited about today's topic. Will and I are looking forward to learning more about legal entities. You've heard of LLCs, partnerships, sole proprietorships. Well, we're going to be talking about various ways that legal entities can hold title to Hawaii property. Plus, we're going to delve in and just a little bit, we're going to talk about real estate investment trust, the realm of that. And so we're super excited. And yes, we're very, very excited to have our special guest, Daniel Lam Esquire, partner at one of the big law firms in Hawaii, Goodsill Anderson Quinn and Stifel. And can I just say that I'm proud to be a former colleague of Daniel's at the Goodsill Law Firm years ago. And you know, Daniel's expertise is in venture capital, mergers and acquisitions, M&A, legal entity structure, uh, that we're going to be talking about today, securities regulations, corporate and governance. Man, he's your go-to business attorney. Welcome, Daniel Lam. Welcome, Daniel. Hi, Will. Hi, Leone. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for joining us. You know, I'd say that in the vast majority of real estate transactions, buyers will take title to their property in their own name or sometimes more commonly now in their individual trust if they have one set up. So you're a business attorney, and we're hoping to learn various ways that legal entities can hold title. So to kind of start it off, why would you? Why would someone want to put a property into a legal entity versus into their individual name or into their trust? Can you share about that with us? Yeah, sure. You know that's that's a good question. You know, I would say that you know what, I think the biggest answer or the biggest reason why you know people would want to put real estate in an entity. Uh, as you know, compared to just holding it individually is for liability protection, right? So I know we, we hear that phrase thrown around a lot, but, you know, at, at its core, it's basically that, you know, if, if you are, I think, um, using property as a way to uh, produce income, or let's say you, you rent it out, or you have an investment property, or, you, or you're doing something of, those, of the nature, running a business through it, then every person you deal with, whether it's a you know a counterparty to a contract, a tenant, you know if there's a problem, right? If someone gets injured or if there's a a contract dispute, something like that, you know, then if you don't own the entity through some um, limited liability protection uh, mechanism, through you know most commonly through uh, an entity, then you know your personal assets could be at risk if if there's ever a problem. Um, so I would say that's the the biggest reason why you know people would put uh, their property into an entity. Ah, uh, okay, got it, got it. So let's kind of talk, you know get into these various types of legal entities. So sole proprietorships. Um, so I've heard of that, and I think uh, people have heard of that. But in terms of the benefits, uh, the protection that it may or may not provide. Well, what are your thoughts on that, of holding uh, title to real property in sole proprietorships? Right. I would say that, you know, I would not recommend holding property in a sole proprietorship if, again, you're using it for some sort of, you know, business operations or income producing uh, purposes. Uh, because like I mentioned on the limited liability side, for sole proprietorships, you know, there is no limited liability, right? So essentially, sole proprietorship is is another fancy way of just saying that you own the property in your personal name um right and and that's i think the the key point there where if you don't have the time or effort or or the need really to form something go through the the steps to form a, a company you know with the with the dcca you know with with the the tax entities right um go through the steps then that's kind of what you're left with, right? Then you can just call it a sole proprietorship, which is really just an individual um, operating an unincorporated business uh, for profit, right? And the benefits there is that, like I said, there's no cost, 
there's no administrative burdens. Uh, you can really just get it off the ground and just start running your business without forming anything. You can hold title in, in your name. Um, can hire employees, right? You can do all that stuff, you know. But really, you you don't have any liability protection. I think that's one of the you know the biggest pitfalls of using a sole proprietorship, which which again, these days are falling out of favor, and and most businesses now are you know incorporated or formed as an LLC. That makes sense. And then, so you're talking about liability, limited liability. So, you know, limited liability corporation. Um, why would someone choose an LLC? I mean, obviously you just kind of outlined about the liability aspects, but are there other benefits to that? Uh, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, so, you know, you mentioned LLCs and, you know, there are a number of different entities that we can you know, touch upon, but, you know, starting with an LLC, I'd say that's the most that's the most um, you know popular these days amongst small business owners or even real estate investors, just because it's set up very um, you know accommodating to you know whether you're a, a single a single member a single person business owner or you have multiple partners um, you know various different management structures it's it's very flexible with the way you can set it up from management rights to economic rights to exit rights if you have if you have uh, more than one partner um you know and you, it still provides the limited liability protection that that we were talking about uh and you know basically it's it's i think the difference between that and let's say a corporation is that you know llcs are, are newer um they're a creature of, of contract meaning members have the freedom to contract uh, the, um how it's governed basically whereas corporations it's much more rigid and and formal with uh you know what the statutes require uh with you know annual minutes and and meetings and that sort of thing that's just one one difference um but but again i mean you can set it up whether it's you know on management structure like i mentioned whether it's member managed or manager managed right and from there i mean there's there are different nuances where if you could have passive members you could have one manager, you could have the members involved in management. So it's very flexible there. Um, one key, I think, uh, advantage of a LLC versus a, a corporation, a C Corp, um, is that an LLC is, is a pass-through entity, right? So a pass-through entity, meaning that all the income and loss and profits that come through the, the entity flow right up through to the owner's um, tax returns. So every item of income just gets taxed one time compared to let's say a corporation a c-corp where you know the income is taxed once at the corporate level and then when you make a distribution or dividend up to the owners then it's taxed again at, at those individuals uh personal um you know on their taxes so that's i think one of the the reasons why uh you know small businesses and and especially real estate investors would, would choose a, an LLC over a corporation. And there's some other reasons why not to, uh, you know, use a corporation for to hold real estate, but we can, don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves right now. We can cover that in a second. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, Daniel, just to kind of unpack the LLCs a little bit. So let's say that, um, you know, a doctor, uh, she has her own office right now. It, it's in a sole proprietorship, right? Uh, Carol Kimura, MD, right? The office is under her name. Mm -hmm. Now she's like, okay, you know what? Maybe I need some liability pr protection. So like she herself could be a single member LLC, just one person. You don't need uh, multiple people. Is that correct? Right, that's correct. So that, that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, the LLC is much more, I think, popular these days than uh, let's say a limited partnership, right? For that reason and that for a partnership, you need by definition you need to have more than one person that's operating the business together for profit um so as an llc there's no similar rule or requirement basically so you can have in your example a single member that forms an llc that's essentially the the single the managing member um so it has all the decision making control um, all the profits and loss goes right to that member, you know, but it's a separate entity for legal purposes. And there's some protections from liability because of that. For instance, 
if there's a contract with a renter or a, a third party um, and there's a dispute and that entity gets sued, you know, if as long as everything was done properly and the entity was set up correctly and all the taxes are paid, it's adequately capitalized, and essentially the owner treats it like a separate entity, then the idea is that, you know, courts should also treat it as a separate entity. And if there's any liability generally to that LLC, then it should stay at that level. And in that situation, the doctor's personal assets, you know, as long as they're not commingled with the LLC's assets, then they should be protected. Um, now, yeah. the one, yeah, the one caveat with that, right? And this is that example was, let's say, liabilities for for um, for a debt or, or creditor. Um, liabilities for actions now it's something different, right? In that same example, if they're a doctor and they're you know practicing medicine and they you know leave a sponge or something in. Uh, you know, the, the patient's leg when they're operating, you know, just because they're operating through an LLC, you know, doesn't necessarily absolve that person from liability, right? Because the actual action, the actual, um, you know, the, the claim is related to something that that person actually did. So I think there, you know, you can appreciate the nuance there, but I think in, in general, there is just, you know, a more protection, um, you know, uh, when you have a an entity that provides limited liability protection, which which all entities do, uh, for the most part, right, except for general partnerships, you know, which we can again talk to in a second about in a second. Would you see like any concerns about holding property in an LLC? I mean, those are some really great benefits. Obviously, you mentioned taxes. You mentioned protecting your own things, your own personal assets and things like that, right? As long as you're not the cause of the damage. But right. do, you, do you feel like there's anything that, you know, to be concerned about? You know, that's a good question. I mean, I'd, I'd say the biggest thing is maybe the administrative, uh, you know, efforts that you need to do, right? You have to form the entity, which it's not a lot. Um, but then there's annual reports that you have to do and, and file with the with the DCCA. Um, like I said, it's a pass-through entity, so the entity, the LLC, doesn't pay its own taxes, but there is an informational return usually if, if there's more than one partner, and then you start getting into you know K ones and tax returns for multiple members. Um, but if it's just a single member LLC, you know everything just flows up to the individual's uh, own personal tax return. So there's not, I think, a whole lot more to do there. So you know there's really not much of a downside i think especially if it's a i'd say you know fairly fairly straightforward llc i mean you can still do everything you can just as if you're doing it yourself just with the added protections of of uh you know liability protection so you talked about uh partnerships the various types right so um Partnerships, you know, I hear about law firms or medical offices or, I mean, something, some investors, you know, they so-called partner up, right? And mm -hmm. maybe or a partnership. So can we kind of dig into that a little bit deeper in terms of why would someone, you know, would want to go into a, a partnership, a legal partnership? And what are the some, some of the benefits of that? Yeah, no, I definitely. I think, you know, um, partnerships. I think we're have been around for some time now, as, as we all know. So prior to LLCs becoming, I guess, the new the new thing, twenty or thirty years ago, right? I mean, people that wanted um, the association that w was more flexible than a corporation with pass through benefits, like I mentioned, um, how an LLC provides for tax purposes, you know, use partnerships often, right? Because similarly, well, LLCs under the tax code. You know, generally the the default rule is their tax as partnerships. So from a tax perspective, they're treated the same, but just from a you know from a legal um, statutory standpoint, they're a little bit different, right? In the sense that um, it's going through first, you know, we'll start with general partnerships. You know, basically you, general partnerships. There's nothing that needs to be formed be, um, with the state. It's really just an association of two or more people that are um, engaged in business uh, for a profit. Right. So similar to a sole proprietorship, just if you or I were just to start a business and just, you know, start operating without forming anything, that would be a sole proprietorship. Same thing with a general partnership. And there's rules and statutes on that. But 
would say those are those are less prominent because um just like a sole proprietorship there's unlimited liability for general partners in a partnership so there's real no benefit um to doing that with a partner without formalizing their arrangement that provides some limited liability protection which is why limited partnerships uh you know were formed and that's something where it's a general partnership and then you file something with the state uh to kind of form the limited partnership and what that means is you know again two people or two um persons in the business for a profit but in a limited partnership one one of those partners has to be a general partner so you can have multiple limited partners a lot of lps as you might you might be familiar with but there always needs to be one general partner uh and and typically the general partner has the management authority to do the day-to-day -day. limited partners are more right limited in their management rights um, but because of that general partners by law have unlimited liability right so the um, the policy there being that limited partners entrust all of the the management and activity operation decision making control to the general partner um so they have some um responsibilities and they're uh, subject to unlimited liability now mm -hmm. what general partners normally do is they basically just form another entity such as a limited liability company or a corporation which itself provides limited liability protection right so then that if that's the general partner, then although it's going to have unlimited liability, the actual individual operators of that general partner would be, you know, isolated somewhat if that general partner entity is also, you know, it just happens to be um, an entity that has limited liability to protection itself. Yeah, um, kind of confusing, yeah. but, you know, you can see how, um, you know, there's it's rare that you'd get a general partner that's just out there individually anyway yeah. um but i mean kind of the question probably that would come up is well i see L limited partnerships i see llc's right like what's the difference or why would one choose one versus the other right and and i think again it really depends on the facts but what i would say in general you see limited partnerships now more for you know, large investment real estate funds that we'll talk about and where you have a lot more maybe passive limited partner um and you know general partners that are more experienced institutional um real estate investment funds let's say that this is the more traditional model so i think a lot of uh you know people and constituents are familiar with the structure uh, but with that said i mean there are a lot of llcs now that are run like lp real estate funds and so i've i've worked on a number of you know llc real estate funds as well so i would say that you know there's there's not a whole um you know there's not one specific reason why you want to use lps over llc's in this situation other than um you know that's kind of a larger scale institutional i think um level real estate investment funds are i think typically are still using lps often Hmm. Okay. So, you, you know, before we get into real estate investment fund topic, and, you know, I'm excited to learn more, a lot more about it. So if it was just like Leonie and myself, husband and wife, for example, then would you say of all the options we talked about, and let's say corporation, that's just too complicated, would it just be an LLC then? Or uh, I would, yeah, I would say so. I mean, just because there's more options on, um, right, like, you could have a manager managed LLC where both of you could be managers. You could have a member managed LLC where both of you are member managers, but then it's difficult to like bring on a third party investor. Let's say you could have a manager managed LLC where, you know, one of you was a manager, but in order to do a certain enumerated list of things, it would require the consent from the other party and with had veto rights. And, you know, there's different ways you can kind of, you know get into the, the the details again on the three buckets i'd say you know the economic management and exit rights right exit rights meaning you know if a partner leaves or or wants to you know get out of the business i mean the rights to kind of buy or sell or um you know exit transfer restrictions that sort of thing but but yeah i, I think i say like i mean most people are using llc's these days especially for real estate i mean i, I know we're running out of time here but quickly just 
Um, by contrast, like explain why, you know, in a corporation, let's say, um, you know, of course, there's two levels of tax there, right? On a C corp, right? And C and S, S corp, that's basically a check the box for uh, an IRS tax classification. But starting with C corps, that's like the typical large corporations that you see and you hear two levels of tax, right? So income that comes in, tax the, at the corporate level. And then if you send money out through distributions, dividends to shareholders, it's taxed again, hence the, the two layers of taxation. So that's already uh, an, an issue um, holding real estate, right? If um, um, Because then it's taxed twice if you're getting real estate, let's say rental income, right? It's going to be taxed at the corporate level. And then again, when you actually take the money out to, you know, to the investor. So that's one reason why you want to, wouldn't want to do that. An S corp would get around that because an S corp, it's a, a corporation, but it's taxed as a, uh, it's a pass through entity. So similar to LLCs and, and partnerships, I mean, you'd get that one level of taxation that flow through. So that would be okay. But I think what an S corp doesn't kind of get around though, is that for corporations, if you contribute a property into the corporation, let's say you own a property, you want to move it to an entity. If you contribute it into a corporation, sometimes that's a taxable event where you have to recognize gain on that sale. Whereas if you if you do that in an LLC or partnership, you wouldn't necessarily have to recognize that taxable event at that time. Um, same thing when you take the property out. You know, there's there's times when property needs to be transferred out of the entity, right? Without prior to liquidating it, let's just say, you know, partnerships breaking up and you know someone's gonna get cash, either you know, or transferring out the interest in the property, whatever. In an LLC in a in a partnership that pass through generally, it's not a taxable event. But again, in a corporation, you know, if you move property out of the corporation, then it can be a taxable event, which means even though you don't sell the actual property at that time, you're just moving it out. The shareholders, you know, might be taxed on that at that time, which is, you know, usually not what anybody wants. So this is why, you know, one key takeaway is, I mean, you'll notice that most real estate funds or, you know, holding companies, I mean, unless they're really large large scale companies with a ton of, um, you know, operations other than just real estate. Um, there are not many, if any, you know, co corporations that are holding real estate. All oh, right on. Okay. Yeah. So you talk about real estate investment funds. I want, I want to get into that. So what is a real estate investment fund? I mean, just in plain language. Yeah, I, I would say it's, um, you know, it's just an entity that, takes capital from more than one person in order to um, leverage the additional cash or capital to you know purchase and either develop or manage income producing real estate basically so you know leone mentioned earlier you know just like a, a hui or a um a syndication right i think is a lot of uh people call it these days in the real estate scene right basically you get a bunch of people together um invest money um and you know either buy and, and and develop property flip it uh rent it i think there's a lot of different sizes and and um type structures of these real estate funds but at its core i think that's you know kind of sums it up i think for all of them i mean there are a lot of securities laws and things to kind of keep in mind um you know but basically i mean there's a lot these days uh opportunities i think especially in hawaii to invest in real estate and and you know i think fund formation and making sure if you're uh, an investor and you're presenting with an opportunity right that you really know all your rights and obligations and what you're getting yourself into and again on the other side if you're the one that's creating the fund you have the idea right i, I mean that's just half the battle right you have to do it in a way that is compliant with the law um that will mitigate you know risk to yourself and and to the to the enterprise um, and, you know, Hawaii's built a lot on relationships and reputation and, 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 you know, I think it's, it's important that, you know, documentation and structure is, is really thought out from the beginning. So it's sets everybody's expectations, uh, you know, at the get go. And, and after that, you know, people can just worry about the business and, 
and you know hopefully not have to look back at the documents you know once they're drafted so say that you know we wanted to start the lamb and lamb in real estate investment fund I like that <laughs> me too where's me where's me <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah so like how would how would i get started or how would we get started with that together like there's two of us maybe we'll we will think about letting him join in too you know but um what would be the the beginning stages for us <laughs> to have to get that yeah. together yeah you know i that's a good question you know i think i think it always starts with you know the business first and then back into the legal stuff right so I think first you need to have the idea, right? So whether the plan is to, you know, in, like what's the what's the investment strategy, right? Is a strategy to find, um, you know, kind of distressed properties, right? And kind of fix it up and and then flip them or sell them? Or is it to develop in and, and create, you know, income producing real estate, right? Is, is it to, you know, uh, develop, um, you know, a, a, a care home, assisted living, you know, just all, whatever it is, I think that's that's where you start. Right. And then you kind of have to think about the financials, right? Because investors, a lot of them, they want to uh, look at what's their ROI, what's the projected return. And, and I think it's important if you're leading a fund or starting a, an entity, real estate investment fund, you know, um, on the security side, you don't want to misrepresent or promise one thing, right? So it's difficult. So a lot of it, it's you got to use projections and forward looking statements and um, a lot of aspirational you know, language, that sort of thing. Um, you know, but again, anyway, you got to just, you know, draw that up and, you know, generate interest, um, you know, through people, you know, you don't want to advertise the investment opportunity because there's securities issues there. Um, but basically when you get all that together, you got to just, again, think about the three buckets that I mentioned before, right? The economic rights, management rights, and exit rights of everybody involved. And, you know, that's how things start with a term sheet and, you know, documents going back and forth, but, but yeah, it all starts with the idea. Um, and I'd say the projected financials, and then you'll know if it's a good idea or not. Right. And then kind of back into the, to the legal documentation. Very cool. I like, so it basically starts with a business plan. Like you have to have that together and then you kind of get into the legal setup and everything. Right. Right. That makes sense. We learned so much. I wish we had a lot more time, Daniel, but any last uh, words or you know, we're almost out of time, but any last messages to our viewers before we finish it off? Um, no, you know, just, you know, thanks for having me. You know, Will and Leone, I, I had a great time, um, you know, first time on Think Tech, and, you know, I feel honored to be a guest of, of, of both of you all. So, uh, you know, thanks for everyone for listening and tuning in. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to Will and Leone and, you know, looking forward to, to talking to you all again. Thank you so much, Daniel. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. All right. Aloha.